Hello, I'm Samia Aryan. I'm a tech philosopher and the founder of Impeak. My guest on today's podcast is Stacy Spikes, the original founder of MoviePass. MoviePass was a very interesting concept when it first came out, but it didn't do so well when the company's investors pushed for massive adoption at a very low cost. Stacy was pushed out of his own company at the time, and he has now bought it back and is growing it once again. One of the reasons why I was interested in his work is that he is incorporating Web3 and blockchain technology into their loyalty program. This was a great conversation which gave me some insights into that. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. What I wanted to explore today is firstly what the story has been for uh, MoviePass uh, up until now and then whether there is um, any kind of thoughts around uh, the Web3 business model, how you see it might fit in with that. So why don't you start by introducing yourself a little bit and, and uh, tell me like a, a quick overview and story of, of MoviePass from start to now. Great. So thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Stacy Spikes. I'm the original co-founder and CEO of MoviePass. And we launched in the U.S. the first theatrical subscription service. So imagine Netflix for movie theaters. And the idea was you could pay one flat monthly fee and you could go to any theater you wanted anywhere in the United States. Um, and the original version, you could go every day if you wanted. Um, and in 2017, we had an exit that we had a private equity group that wanted to buy the company. And um, one of the tricky things was they wanted to drop the price from $30 a month to $10 a month. And um, I said, well, that's good for a kind of a stunt to say, look, you know, we've got this growth suddenly, but that's not a sustainable price point because it was just too cheap. Anyway, we agreed to drop the price for limited time and the all of a sudden we got a hundred thousand people who signed up in a single day and they were jumping up and down with excitement and i said that's not sustainable and then they're like no 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 we, this is great we know what we're doing and we started adding another quarter of a million new subs every month and it just was going through the roof and long story short um we agreed to disagree i got forced out of the company and I told them, I said, you're not going to make it. And within 12 months, they went bankrupt. So I went, kind of licked my wounds, started something else, moved on, figured, okay, well, stuff happens. And last February, so a year ago, I bought MoviePass back out of bankruptcy. So I went back, purchased it, and made the determination to relaunch the company. And a lot of the Web3 um, component came into the mix when, uh, as you probably know that know about them, Animoca Brands um, became our lead investor in this round. And um, not to go too far down the road, I'll let you ask questions. But the, you know, when Yat and I got together, the idea was how can, um, you know, they they were noticing that art, music film, gaming were areas where NFT and Web3 was getting a lot of traction. And um, he said, I think you guys have a really strong, since you kind of represent the consumer, be the place that cinema kind of gets traction around the Web3 models that are out there. And so that's that's kind of what has happened and where we are today. So. Okay, super interesting. So um, we are going to go back to talking a little bit about how that all felt and what you did during that, st- that time and like going back to the story of like the psychological toll that that must have taken. Um, but um, talking about the Web3 business models. So where is that right now? Um, how do you see that working? Is it like people are going to buy uh, a specific NFT, and then that NFT will give them access to uh, to a certain amount of movies or content. Uh, how do you see that exactly working? Yeah, so one of the things, so there's two kind of split ways that we see it. One is what, like what you described, access to something. So 
hey, you went to see this movie, maybe uh, there's a limited number of NFTs that get dropped with the opening weekend, let's say. Um, and those people will not only have that NFT, but they'll then get access to some experience or content that no one else got to see um, for being you know, early to the movie or early, early to help out the opening weekend. Um, so that's, that's one way. Then the other way is, is um, if you've heard of POAPs, like proof of attendance protocols. So the, you're starting to see it with sports teams and others where you can really reward and have a, rela a digital relationship with super fans that, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to make up a scenario here. So let's say there's three Batman movies coming out and you went to see it in the first weekend of the first Batman and you got a pull app that said, Hey, thank you. And here's some limited stuff and some digital collectibles for you because you were there. Now, the second installment of that movie is coming out and you also went the second time to see it in its opening weekend. So now they knew you saw it the first time and they want to reward you again. So they may have some golden tickets and other things that they can throw in the mix. But what it does is it creates this relationship that you can give people digital collectibles and things that they can use. Um, they can trade those things. Those things can have value. Um, and they're, they're limited edition pieces that can then access this digital world. So even if I want to go into the Batman video game and I gave you, I don't know, a limited edition Joker car, right? Whatever. Um, now, you know, only certain people had those things and they were people who were early adopters or super fans or saw it a certain number of times. It extends what the what Disney likes to say, it extends the experience. Um, so it creates that relationship between each installment of a film that drops. And so that's really the high level idea of how all of these things can start to work together. Well, I have a lot of questions. So, um, <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> so um, who manages this? Is it MoviePass that manages um, that? Uh, like, for example, let's say if you want to give people a um, limited edition digital collectible of uh, the Batman movie, who has got the IP here? So, does it mean that you have to have a relationship with the people who, uh, who created the the film so that you have the authority to do that? Is that that's how how it works? Yeah. So the way we see this unfolding is. Um, MoviePass is going to be the gateway, but the studio is going to be the giver of the of the NFTs are the collectibles. Um, so we're not going to try and be the IP holder. It's just too too hard and an impossible task. Um, so because we are a ticketing platform and there's a transactional um, relationship at the point of that transactional exchange is when it unlocks that you're going to get that, that uh, you know, I'll, I'll use NFT as a generic term. You'll get that NFT because you'll come through our app and you will get your ticket and it confirms you win. It confirms what theater you went to. It confirms what day you went. All of that information is in there. And now you have this collectible. And then if they want to digitally continue to communicate with you, we've basically set up that relationship. And um considering that for example with with the within the nfts we now have this issue of royalties i mean i'm sure you probably know very well yeah. that you know uh, there are new marketplaces people don't want to pay royalty so how will you create a recurring revenue so for us we so this is where we're we're a little bit different so nfts primarily are acting as art that appreciates in value and gets traded, we're not looking at it like that. So we're looking at it like this is a collectible that it has a limited release and whether it gets value on a secondary market or not is not our, we're, we're not trying to be that secondary market who is capitalizing on the upside of how much that increases. We don't care about that. So for us, it's a bit of a different relationship. 
in that we think that if we were trying to be a trading marketplace, um, it, it would complicate it in ways that we don't want to be uh, burdened by that. We just want to be, if, if Warner Brothers and Batman say, we want to drop these NFTs, could you help us do that with every person that goes to see the movie on opening weekend on these days or at these locations? We have the infrastructure to do that. And in that way, the, it's a collectible on our side, but if the consumer goes and mints it, right, then it becomes an NFT on their side versus us, everything out of our door is minted from the gate. We're, we're looking at it differently. Okay, so, so the, the membership of the movie pass is not an NFT. No, it's, you don't need that. So here, here's one of the burdens that we found. So like, let's take me who's in it, interested in the space and let's take my mother who absolutely could care less. You want the same ease and functionality across people who are interested in it and not interested in it. And so what we found was if you go too far down the Web3 purist route, you really diminish. Like, let's imagine in order to get a, in order to get a, a movie pass ticket and get one of these, you need uh, to have a wallet. You need to uh, have everything, all those pieces that you need to just to get your ticket, just to get an NFT. Well, there's a lot of people that if you put make them jump through those hoops today, it's a really bad experience for them. But if you say to everyone, okay, we're going to do an airdrop that's a limited, you're going to get it anyway, but then go mint it and put it into your own wallet. Then we don't have to have the learning curve for a lot of people who maybe don't care. Yeah. Um, but but once pe- people do have that wallet and once they do uh, understand tokens, it makes life so much easier. For example, we are That's building exactly this. Right. You know, we are building this platform, uh, which is for token gated communities managing all their content and collaborate with each other. And uh, basically, you can have live events. You know, you can have uh, uh, like you know uh, digital uh, kind of live events. You can have um, pre-recorded video, pre-recorded podcasts, um, you know, newsletters, everything pre-recorded uh, or, or prepared, right. right? So, and then you can you can token gate that, and and then you can token gate a whole channel with a specific, um, you know, you can call it an NFT. It can, but I think of it more as like a membership token. So actually, we are creating yeah. now these membership tokens that are so bound or wallet bound, you know, that they they are not necessarily tradable. And um, you you can make them tradable if you want, or you can make them not not tradable and make them valid for only a certain amount of time. But the reason why it's better to do it that way rather than a normal subscription is because when when it's a token, you can um, you can collaborate with other communities simply by adding their token. So yeah. you know, like say for example, there is a community uh, A. Uh, and then there's community yes. B, and they each have got their own token. So community A can add the uh, the contract address of community B to their um, uh, you know channel, and it means that now uh, they can collaborate, right? They, they can say, hey, we are going to give one month free access to your um, members, and you give you can give one month free access to our members, and and this way we uh, we you know um, uh, we coordinate and co- collaborate. And these are this is this is just like one of the ways that that you can do that now imagine if if cinemas had that you know like you know if yeah. if um uh imagine like if, if universities have that like universe say for example princeton university has its own token harvard university has its own token and then they can give access to each other's library simply by adding each other's tokens it, it can create so many different right. ways of of um you know uh creating experiences that um it's it's just so fascinating um which is why we're here building that so i wonder what um you know okay now the first step would be maybe to give it to them as a collectible as like something that you get as yeah. a, as an add-on but eventually i can see that being an actual you know uh subscription model yeah so we yeah i i think you're you're 100 right i think the 
we do see the viability of possibly having a movie pass token that puts you in that ecosystem movie pass possibly having its own wallet um, and kind of moving up the stream um, i think what we want to ensure and and i think a lot of businesses can run into this you can overshoot the dream so far that there's no practical use for the masses right now and so because we have this core business we do see web3 benefits from it but we want to make sure we also have our our primary business covered um, and that to me personally being the ceo i i don't believe in making things harder just to make them cooler but somehow making sure that we're adding value that's cost effective at the same time. It's kind of like saying, sure, going to Mars would be really cool, but if it's too hard and costs too much, it's, you know, the moon's right there. We don't go that often either. But so I think you have to make sure that your costs come down. It's it has a smoothness to its experience. Um, and because you just don't want to take your core business make it an elite business for a few that really care about it, but regular people. So our goal is to try and get 10% of all moviegoers to become subscribers on our platform. And so if you can reach that number, that's, God, that's, you know, call that 50, 60 million people, right, globally. Well, if you get 50 or 60 million people, you need something that's really nice and smooth for them to use especially if you want all theaters, all movie studios, and all customers to be able to use it seamlessly. Um, that's, and so that's what I want to make sure that we do keep that first, right? Yeah, first. Yeah, um, definitely. At least the yeah. first uh, step is, is uh, that way. So um, how does it work at the moment? Is it like, uh, what, what's the pricing right now? And once they get the uh, subscription, is it that they have to go to your website to buy the ticket or, or when they go to another website, mm -hmm. how does it recognize that they have the movie pass? Yeah, great. So um, roughly the prices are 10, 20 or $30. Those are three different tiers. And we like to say, are you a person who likes to go monthly to the movies? Are you a person who likes to go weekly to the movies? Are you a person who likes to go daily to the movies? Well, those three different plans kind of put you in the ballpark of that. So like the lowest tier gets you one to three movies a month. Um, the middle tier gets you four to seven movies a month. And then the highest tier will get you up to, you could go virtually every day if you want to go to matinees and some of the off-peak times. So that's that's the plan. But the way our system works is we actually give you a debit card that you can check into any theater you want. And once you check in in the app, it unlocks your card, you purchase ticket, and you go. But the way it starts each month is you get a certain number of credits so let's say I get 30 credits and if I want to go to matinees, so before four o'clock every day, I could go to the movies every day if I want to go to matinees. But let's say I want to go just Friday night opening weekend. Well, I'm going to use maybe 15 or 20 credits if I go peak times. But if I go off peak, I can get far more volume, right? So we, we do deals with the theaters that make it that we can bring those prices down because we work out wholesale pricing with them. And that's basically how it works. Um, so it gives you the opportunity to go more, save more money, go wherever you want um, because you become a subscriber and there's that value exchange. And uh, how do you see the, the usage of um, cinemas uh, having changed over the past few years? Has it become better, uh, worse? Is the industry booming or is it like you know, more people are watching at home? Yeah, so, you know, this is, a, it, it's kind of funny. There's a, I think cinema has a perception problem. So um, a lot of people don't know that movie going is still the number one entertainment at 
out of home entertainment activity in the world, more than all sporting events combined. So it's really funny because what you have is the streaming platforms put a lot of press out as though we're going to overtake cinema. Why would you ever go when you can see it at home for far less money? But the way to think, think about cinema is cinema is the live event of the movie industry. So what we found is there's not an either or. There's not people who say, I am Netflix only or I only go to movies. We actually, in theaters, we actually found that people do both. Where we found that cinema has been having a problem is as the streaming services were becoming more popular, a lot of the talent and the studios all shifted their resources to sh their streaming platforms thinking, oh, we're going to make a lot more money than we do with cinema. Now you're starting to see them drift back and they're starting to have a dual approach. And we saw this with, um, so to give you an idea, Disney ran several tests. They did day and date uh, with um, Black Widow. Sorry, I completely drew away. So with Black Widow, they did day and date um, and they ended up having a lawsuit over it. So they had the film in theaters and streaming at the same time. And it did a certain amount. Then they kept doing experiments and they were uh, spreading the windows apart a little bit. Well, with Black Panther, the most recent one, they had a, I think it was almost a 90 day window between and Black Panther was the highest viewed movie on its platform. And it did, you know, a billion dollars worth of box office. So it proved that you can have both and it's not an either or trade off. So I think that cinema is stepping into its new phase. But the way to think of it is think of cinema as concert business for the music industry, where YouTube is the thing that you may watch or listen to music on it. But the the venues and the stadiums is where you actually go and he, like look at look at how Taylor Swift sold out worldwide in a matter of minutes because we like communal things we like to go out and everyone was saying that the uh, concert business was over when Travis Scott did his concert in the metaverse and everyone said no one's going to go to no one's going to real real concerts anymore they're all going to do it in the metaverse but it's both we're going to do both and so that's that's my thought mm -hmm. okay no super interesting so going back to your business model is it a little bit more like an insurance uh, idea where you are banking on people not using it to a, to a little bit, but you, you add in the factor that you're also buying tickets at a wholesale price. Um, so subscriptions are always, you want it to cost less than the money you bring in, right? So uh, you have to create value for the consumer um, by saying, okay, you're a subscriber, you're paying, you're paying in advance. So there's an advantage to that. That allows us to go into the marketplace, buy at a wholesale price, and then offer that back at a discount than if you just did walk-up transactions on a daily basis. So it's the same general idea of all subscription businesses. You want to add more value because you have a reoccurring revenue that you can count on that you know people are going to pay then that can cause you to do longer term planning where even movie theaters on friday night they don't know what the movie's going to gross right they they have no idea who's going to come what if it has bad reviews what if it flops uh they do not know when you have a subscription business you can bring those costs down because of planning okay very cool so going back to your journey um, of, uh, you know, how you went back and bought your company. But tell me a little bit about that. What were you doing during that time? Like, you know, when, when you walked away from the company, you know, then, then you went back, like during that time, how did you deal with that? And, and what else were you working on? Yeah. So, um, so first I felt sorry for myself for about a week or two after I got fired and kicked out. 
Um, and then I started working on a company. So I've been fascinated with the idea that, um, you know, the internet, we get it for free, but what we're doing is we're selling our digital selves. And I believe that we should own our own attention and that with the rise of the attention economy and a blockchain technology, you know, my belief is that instead of you going and uh, I get my Facebook for free, but ads are being shown to me forcibly and I don't see the ad revenue, but I get it for free. The idea of what if I want, um, I want Netflix for free each month and I agree that I will watch branded content in exchange for being able to get that. But I'm controlling my time and I'm controlling what I see and you're not selling my data and information on a third party platform. So I believe the future is we're going to own and monetize our own attention rather than people doing it. And I can get paid on the blockchain rather than getting paid uh, just in the goods and services. So let me give you another example. You want to ride in an Uber and it's a 15 minute wait for the car to get here. And then it's a 15 minute ride. And what if I send you a half hour show that you can watch with branded content and I'll give you that ride half off. So it's kind of like that, that your, your attention uh, you start to monetize yourself. So that's the company I was starting to build. And then when MoviePass um, went into bankruptcy, I took that company and I bought MoviePass back. Okay, cool. So um, that that company sounds more like, you know, you're speaking my language now. So so tell yeah. me more about that. So so did that, did you stop that? No, we got we got pretty far with it. So we secured our patents. Uh, that company was called Pre-Show. Um, and so the whole idea is it's it's in line with um, all of the the European standards, but it it makes it that all advertising is opt-in only, and I get to approve what I see and I don't see, and there's a determined exchange rate for my attention. And so I, I'm making that money and now the platform, I make 80% and the platform makes 20% rather than the platform just keeps everything. And sure, it gives me some software for free, but it's making more money off of selling, selling to me. Um, so when, when what we believe should happen is that all of those transactions and the ledgers are happening on the blockchain. Are you familiar with BAT, B-A-T? the Brave browser with yes. basic attention. Okay. Yes. So the basic attention tokens is the same idea. We just take it one step further and say, we're going to make that exchange more um, transparent of a transaction. Like you want a month of Netflix for free. That costs $10. Here's how much time and attention we want from you. And a brand might say, Will you step into virtual reality and test drive our new car? And it'll take you 15 minutes and we'll cover the cost of your Netflix for free. But instead of paying me in cash, it's going to pay me in my attention tokens on, on the platform. So that's, I'm, I'm still deeply excited about that. But for us, we want to start with movie tickets and that helps us get down the path. But the idea is the same. And then you can move into gaming and other areas that you can do that. Yeah, no, that's very cool. We actually have, um, it's not too far from what we are working on um, uh, with with the platform that I'm building, um, but it's more like on, on the educational uh, content yeah. type. Uh, although uh, the way that we are moving, you know, like anybody can use the platform uh, to create kind of like monetize their content and then there will be an advertising model that will and there will be a token and and but all of these are 
really dependent on uh, what happens to the um, ir- regulations around tokens because it yeah. just it makes it so yeah. hard uh, to build a business model around it as it is right now. Yeah. Uh, especially for yeah. you being in 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 New York, I'm I'm guessing like that's. Oh that's, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's not exactly the. I'm in London, but I'm I'm even considering moving the company to Dubai because it's just easier for, yeah. yeah. Okay. Super interesting. So, um, so you think, you know, you are, you, you're kind of like letting that one rest for now because the, um, uh, you've gone back to movie ba- pass and, and, uh, of course there's, uh, some overlap, you know, the, I suppose you could bring in some of the technologies from that into what you're building with movie pass. So what's, uh, what's the next step? Like, where are you now in terms of user base and, and what's the next step? You know, how, how's, how's the growth looking and where do you think you'll be, let's say in the next 18 months or so? Yeah. So we, we um, in sept yeah, where are we? So yeah, September of last year, we decided to figure out what the interest levels were. So we opened up a waiting list um, and we did it for just over four days. We had more than 800,000 people sign up for the wait list. Um, We've started letting those people in. And so far, we're really happy with the growth. Um, We're really happy with how things are moving. We've been gating it and getting the kinks worked out and opening up in different markets. So far, we've let it, let the first wave in across the country, um, and so that's that's where we are right now. So we haven't come out of beta and opened it up for the general population, but we are at uh, we we've let in the first wave of the people on the wait list. Okay, very cool. Um, well, I'm going to follow your your progress and, and especially see when you might do uh, a more obvious uh, kind of pivot into Web3 as well. Um, and yeah, look forward to to seeing where it goes and, and if it comes to the UK, testing it out. Although I don't really go to movies these days. I don't really watch anything. I'm just, I just work. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, we, we have to, we have to do something about that. There's a lot of great movies out. I know. I know. Just like I'm building a startup, right? So it's not easy. I know. You um, need, you need breaks though. You need to be able to treat yourself and go it's just watch that if Avatar. I, <laughs> it's just know. that even if I have a break, I really just want to be in the sun and, and out I because know. I'm sitting in front of my computer all the time, right? Like, you know, there are days that like, as soon as I see the sun out, I'm like, oh, please just 10 minutes. I'm going to go down. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. But um, yeah, no, that that's, uh, uh, I can see this being quite attractive to also to companies for their, uh, for their staff, you know, so the, it, it all sounds very interesting. Um, but for me personally, it's going to be most interesting when you really kind of go deeper into Web3 and, and seeing like what you do with that, whether you tokenize, you know, what kind of things uh, you, you think you might do there. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I look forward to following that journey. Great. Well, it, it, it's really been wonderful to talk to you today. And, you know, I watched a lot of the podcasts you've done and the service that you're doing for the community. So please keep doing a great job in the interviews and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Stacy Spikes from MoviePass. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. The full interviews are also available on my YouTube channel, The Somi Ariane Show. 